Uh, Jim and Sherry and their sons, Philip and Jonathan, were appointed missionaries to the Czech Republic in 1994. Can't believe it's been that long. Before that, they were pastors in both New York and Pennsylvania. They served in the Czech Republic until 2004. They were the first Assembly of God uh, missionaries in the Czech Republic after the fall, or after the wall uh, was, was broken down. They went there without knowing uh, the language, but with the heart that God had given them for that country and his call on their lives. After their immediate time in the Czech Republic, they became the area directors of Central Europe, which includes the countries of Austria, the Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Liechtenstein, Poland, Slovakia, and Switzerland. Then after that, in 2017, they were appointed area directors for a new area of the Assemblies of God in the Southeast Europe, which consists of Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, some of those very key uh, areas that have not had a strong gospel witness, Hungary, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, Romania, Serbia, and Slovenia. In their ministries as area directors, they're responsible for organizing and directing the world missions program of the Assemblies of God uh, in, that, in that area. They work with, directly with missionaries that are living in that area. They also work with the National Pentecostal Church leaders uh, to partner there in those countries to support them and that the gospel might be preached. Along with those uh, areas of duty, uh, they are also founding directors of Europe's Heart. And I'd encourage you to Google that and look at that website uh, a little bit later. It's a ministry that focuses on those who live in the margins of society. Uh, celebrities oft, often get all of the, the uh, recognition and so on and so forth, but you know, Jesus ministered in the margins to the people that no one else wanted to minister to. My brother Jim wears many hats uh, as a missionary, as a leader of leaders, as a church planter, and as an academic. Uh, he graduated from Valley Forge. I know he hates this. This is part of the reason I'm doing it. I don't often get to embarrass my brother in front of a whole congregation, but he doesn't get the acknowledgement and recognition that he deserves, and so I'm going to do it. He graduated from Valley Forge uh, Christian College in 1982 uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Bible, Continental Theological Seminary with a Master of Arts in 2012, Masters of Theology from the University of Wales, and most recently he finished his Doctorate of Ministry from Portland Seminary of George Fox University. His doctoral dissertation, uh, Exploring Leadership in the Middle, won awards for the best dissertation in his class. He also has, a, and also a thesis from the University of Wales, Exploring the Partnership of Missions. Some of the awards that he's won is Distinguished Alumni Service, a Valley Forge Academic Dean Award Honors from Continental Theological Seminary, World Changers Award, Portland Seminary, Distinguished Dissertation Award from Portland Seminary as well. He's also served on the Board of Directors and Chairman of the Board of Continental Theological Seminary. As a family, we're hoping that someday he actually accomplishes something in his, in his life. These are many hats that he wears, but the hats that he wears best are husband, father, and brother. This morning, it is an honor to introduce to you, the first time I've been able to introduce him in this way, the Reverend Dr. James Arthur Sabella. Let's welcome him to Hope Assembly of God this morning. Thank you. I don't know who he's talking about, but it's not me. Yeah. God bless you all. Thank you. My brother Randy has always been uh, special in our lives, and we have other brothers, and we get together. We try to kill each other if we can. Not that kind of special. Because uh, for the first time in my life, I watched Elf last night. They forced it on me. Do you all know what Elf is? I didn't know. Sharon and I lived overseas too long. We missed that whole genre, that whole sort of uh, movement, that elf movement. So we learned about it last night. So I'm the special one, believe me, when I, in that context. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Randy, and the kind words. Uh, I honestly don't know who that person is. 
I tell people all the time when I speak and when I share with missionaries and young missionaries especially, 99.99% of the will of God is just getting out of bed in the morning. If you get out of bed and just get going, God will find something for you to do if you just keep moving. We miss it when we sit down or when we're sleeping too long. I don't mean literally sleeping, of course, but there's, there is very something, there's something very true about the idea that the will of God is before us, laid out before us, and when you see a need, you start to fill it, and if God's given you the gift to do that, uh, you try to work on filling that with your gifts. If he hasn't given you the gift to do it, then you see a need, then you find somebody who can help you do it, who has the gift. You just see the needs before you, and you keep moving forward. And before you know it, some needs get filled, and the will of God is fulfilled, and God is honored and glorified. For after all, that is what we are here for, to praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are created for that, for that reason. My wife Sherry is here, of course. We're glad that you're here, Sherry. Why don't you just stand? You don't have to say anything, but please at least let them see you. Thank you. Of course, we appreciate Randy and Dory very, very much. They always treat us so well. Thank you, Dory, for opening your home and letting us stay with you. And the food there is just wonderful. Uh, three, uh, one month ago, we were in Malaga, Spain. Think of that. And now we're in Malaga, New Jersey. We're looking for other Malagas to go to. I don't think anybody here is from Malaga, Spain. Is anyone from Malaga, Spain? No. Is this being on the internet? Is this, gonna, is this on the internet, this? Okay, you can cut this part out. I was in, we were in Malaga, Spain for three weeks. Four weeks. I've got to tell you, the food in Malaga, New Jersey is much better than Malaga, Spain. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you. Amen. If I see rice one more time, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> First thing you got to get when you come here is cheesesteak. You know that, right? Are, are you with me on that? And that's just when we start. This afternoon, I'm going to have pasta. I don't know about you. <laughs> then I might take a nap. Isn't that a beautiful thing? <laughs> Glory to God, as my brother says. Yes. Amen. So... Well, let me begin today to tell you how much we love you and how much we appreciate you. Recently, it's strange, but people have been saying to Sherry and me, isn't it about time you start slowing down? And I go, something wrong with me? Is, is, is there something going on here? I think they begin to see my gray hair. They begin to see that I'm getting shorter. Next time you see me, you know, every time I come, I get shorter. Did you notice that? I used to be 6'3". Do you remember when I first came? One of these days, I'm going to have my pants up to here, my slacks. You know, because I'm Italian. You know what happens to Italians, right? Italian men, when they get old, they get smarter, wiser, and shorter. So one year, somewhere up the way, I'm going to have my pants up here, and I'm going to be walking in, and I'm going to still be going forward and serving Jesus. Because there's never a time when you slow down in the king of, for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's never a time when you look back and say, oh, I've accomplished all of this, Whatever it might be, as minuscule as it might be, there's never a time when you look back and say, I've done enough. We don't stop until our last breath because he is king of kings and lord of lords. So it's an interesting time in our lives because Sherry and I feel honestly like we're just beginning. Now we just found what God wants us to do. Finally, after all these years, we've just got it straightened out. God wants us to keep moving forward. There's so many millions of, millions of people who still don't know about Jesus. There's so many people who still don't have food to eat today. There's still millions of people in Southeast Europe who don't have shoes to wear. There's still hundreds of thousands of people who don't have a home to live in. There are still four million landmines in, in the countries of Croatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, where so, so many landmines are still there, they can never, ever clean them out. And if you stay there for any length of time, you can hear landmines going off in the woods. Either a tree falls, or a rabbit steps on one, or a deer steps on one, or they just go off. There's four million landmines because of the wars. Not long ago, in, 19, in 1990s and 2000, there was the, the, the Balkan Wars. There's still people who deeply and desperately need to hear about Jesus because they've never heard about him before. And as long as that still exists, Sherry and I will still keep moving forward because it's about the call of God on our lives. And I want to tell you about something exciting. A revival continues to go among the gypsy people. You know, we talk about the Roma people all the time. We just finished our second church. I think I have some pictures of it. Will they go up here and there? Both places so I can see? Yes. So Sherry and I are up. I have to look this way because I'm getting old. I need my glasses. Um, 
So Sherry and I and, and, uh, and Mar uh, Brother Marian is up there on the top of this roof. We're just about uh, time to put the roof on this building. This is the second church building we built, and it's unbelievable. The first one we've completed, it's packed out. We, we finished a community center as well in a village not far from there. It became the center of a great revival movement where thousands upon thousands of Roma people are giving their heart to Jesus. It's happening so fast that we can't keep up. In fact, I tell people all the time, if I could build a church every six months, I still couldn't keep up with what God is doing in that country. Isn't it interesting among those people, isn't it interesting that God would choose the margins of society to send revival to? We always think that God's going to send revival to the to the old, the rich, to the wealthy, to the wonderful, to the, to the privileged, to those who are, you know, who are all these wonderful people who, who smell good, who dress good, who look good. They, they, they can't hear from God. They don't have shoes. They live in houses that have dirt floors. They burn wood in their house, and 12 people live in the same house, and their floors are kind of dirty. They can't hear from God. Isn't it interesting that Jesus would choose them to send revival through and throughout Europe? And it's happening even now. And all of Europe is beginning to pay attention. What's happening? What's happening out east? Why is this happening? Even the European Union is looking and saying, why is this happening? What's going on? Something is changing gypsy people's lives. What is it? Who is it? It's Jesus Christ. So let's go to the next one. I have a few pictures. I honestly don't know how many I have here. Oh, here's me standing with the leaders of the church behind that building. That building now has a roof on it. I'm sorry I don't have the newest picture, but it's got a roof there on the inside, and they're moving forward. And the next one... <clears throat> is a sherry with all with all, all the women and women and um it's a funny thing oh you know the person in the middle by the way her name is darlena bean i don't know if you remember john and darlena bean we work closely with them as well in this community um sherry after we took that picture is this the time i think so sherry came up to me and said you won't believe what just happened one of those women came up and they grabbed me in the, on my face and they kissed me right on the lips a long hard kiss <laughs> I've, we've been around a long time. That hasn't happened to Sherry. It happens to me all the time when I go to Poland or other areas. Sometimes they'll kiss the men on the lips, and I'm going, oh. It happens. They, oh, let's just go back, if you don't mind. So they love Sherry so much that when we come, they just get around her, and they hug her, and they love her. We did an outreach to them one time, and Sherry was doing, painting some nails, you know, women's nails, and just putting some nice color on them. And one of the women said that you're the first white, they, they, they don't call themselves white. Please understand what I'm saying here in the context. I'm being very careful. They use this term. But you're the first non-gypsy woman ever to touch me. No one will touch me because my skin color is so dark. They think I'm dirty. You're the first woman who's not a gypsy ever to touch me. And now they kiss her right on the lips. <laughs> Glory to God. It's a good thing. Okay, next one. So this, oh yeah, I do have a picture of it. So this is all closed in now. I mean, it's almost, it's almost completely done and on the inside and they're working on it. There's teams there now. Let's go to the next one too. You, you still awake? I'm gonna, uh, this is our third building coming up. I got a call a couple months ago and they said, you know what? We're finishing the building there and all of a sudden we found that there's a revival taking place in this village called Jaronice. It's in Slovakia. And there's 7,000 gypsies counted. That's, there's probably 10 living there. But there's 7,000 gypsies who live in this village. And the, a revival has broken out there that is just unbelievable. So many people are getting saved. We don't know what to do. We were able, they said we were able to find a piece of property and we want to build another church. And my first, my first thought was absolutely yes. Why? Because there's a need. Why? Because God wants us to fill the need. Jim and Sherry, anyhow. I don't have what it takes to do it, but I know people who do, and I'm going to do that and do it, and we're going to build our third church. Let me go on. We were able to speak there. This is a young man who plays guitar. He sings, God saved his life. It's a beautiful thing when you come in the presence of somebody who was once really, 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 really living a sinful life. I mean, a life of pain and anguish, drugs and alcohol, and everything that you can think of that would destroy someone's life. And when they give their heart to Jesus, God changes them. And when you see them, you can see, he doesn't have to say a word. You can see the smile. You can see God in his life. It's a beautiful thing. Next one. 
This is part of that church that's starting there. It's right outside. I don't often take pictures of the surrounding houses and all because I don't want to, I don't want to give a bad impression to anyone. I don't want to I don't want to show Roma people in a negative light. They already have enough negative spotlight on them. I want you to see, though, where we're at. And I want you to look at the ground, and I want you to look at the building on the right and to the left. This is where they live. But more than that, I want you to see the smile on their faces because this is what God does when God changes a heart and a life. If you go to the next one, please. Here's also, you can see a little bit more of the village. Can you see where they're living uh, and where they stay? Most of the houses that we went to don't have doors on them they just have blankets and so all night long people are coming in and out it's an interesting life it's an interesting life we don't have to process it too long to figure out what goes on and how how unsafe it is and how not good it is but God is changing this community Yaronitsa uh, by the power of his Holy Spirit can we go to the next one please let's see what's here oh these are a group of guys too yeah yeah the guy on the far end is, is, is uh, the one who's playing guitar. The two men in the middle just gave their heart to Jesus. And the little kid in the back, you see him? What's going on over there? You see the color of my skin, right? And I, I want you to take this in the best of ways. Please understand what I'm saying. You see the color of my skin. You see what color it is. And you see the color of theirs. Immediately when we go, they know we're not gypsy, of course. And the kids are looking like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. It's very interesting. Next. This is a house, house uh, church that we preached at there in Yaronitsa. It was packed with people. I mean, just unbelievably packed. And they stood, stood there. They sat there and they listened to the gospel. And we preached and I shared. We prayed for them. It was wonderful. Next one. I think I have a couple more pictures here. Here's some men raising their hands and worshiping God. It wasn't long ago that that hand was holding up a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> And now he's holding it out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You get what I'm saying? You see the picture in your mind? It's a powerful picture. Next one, please. I'm going through here. Oh, here's Sherry and me. Yeah, in the middle of all that. They love us so much and they love Jesus so much. It's an amazing, amazing thing how a group of foreigners who are treated and mistreated and who live on the margins of society, when another foreigner like Sherry and me show up, they open, the, open their arms and they welcome us warmly and friendly. And they feed us, and we sit with them, and we talk with them. It's a beautiful experience. It's a beautiful message of the love of God in their lives. Another one, please. Let me see where we're at here on these. Ah, this is the last one. They welcome us into their home. Yeah, always with a smile, door open, and wanting to come in. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and I will have supper with him. I will eat. It's probably going to be spaghetti. We all know that's the case. I will sup with them, and in the, he with us. There's an open door in Slovakia. There's an open door in Yaronitsa. People are opening their doors, not only to Sherry and me, but they're opening their hearts, their hearts' doors to Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Not only do we go in and sit on the floor and we eat with them or sit at their table and eat with them, but Jesus comes into their heart and he sits there and he sups with them and he talks with them and he shares with them and he changes their lives. From one day to the next, God changes a life. So please pray for Yaronitsa, the village, Please pray for our work in the church that we're doing there. Please pray that God will help us. I just want to share one story. This is not about money, but I would need you to understand something. It's not about money. You need to understand something. When I say, yes, I'm going to help you build a church, the first thing Jim Sabella does is go into panic. Why did you do that? What is wrong with you? Don't you know how to say no? What's the matter with you? You've got that thick skull. The older you get, the thicker it gets. The hair must go inside and make it thicker. I don't know. Not long after I told them yes, I had a call from a, uh, um, um, a man who we were in school together. Um, his name is Stan Arnold. I don't know if anybody you know, any of you know Stan Arnold. He went to Valley Forge Christian College with us. He said, Jim, I was praying for you and Sherry, and God said you have a need, that, that uh, you need something in, in your ministry, and can you share a need with me that you have? And I told him about the church. A couple days later, he wrote to me, and he said, God laid it on my heart. I'm going to send you $10,000 to help build this church. And I said, Stan, you don't have to do that. He said, I know I don't have to. This is God asking me to do this. I have the ability to do this. He said, I want you to know I work a couple jobs, and this is six months of my second job that I'm giving to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to help these people. And I told Stan, thank you, and we prayed 
And he said, Jim, if you ever get a chance to share that with people and you feel it would bless them, share that with them. I want to share that with you today. That if you have a need in your life too, you need to know something. God is greater than that. He sees and he knows. And I also want you to pray for Yaro Nitsa and the people there that God will bless them and that God will help us raise up this church because he truly is king of kings and lord of lords. You still awake? Amen. Do you mind if I go into a quick message here? Uh, what time? I, I honestly don't know where we're at here. Do I have another 12 minutes? All right. 12 minutes? Do I hear 20? Uh, see, there was a line there I crossed. I'm not sure what it was. Let's go back down to 17. See if the, anybody... <laughs> yeah. uh, the mission of God. People often ask Sherry and me why we do what we do. What is it that causes us to do what we do? Let me see if I can find my glasses. Yeah, Jim, you really ought to be slowing down by now. You're wearing glasses, can't even see anymore. People ask Sherry and me why we do what we do. What is it that causes us to do that? Sometimes I don't know. Like I said, we just get out of bed in the morning, we see what needs to be done, we do it and go on from there. And before you know it, 25, 30, 40 years have gone and you've accomplished a little minuscule thing for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's all we ask. But we do it for another reason. It's about the Advent season. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about this Advent. It's about Christmas. Susan David, she wrote a book called Emotional Agility. She gives this illustration. Years ago, a well-regarded British captain stood on the bridge of a British battleship, watching the sun set across the seas. As the story goes, the captain was about to head below for dinner when a lookout suddenly announced, Light, sir, dead ahead two miles. The captain turned towards the helm. Is it steady or moving, he asked, these being the days before radar. Steady, captain. Then signal that ship, the captain said, he ordered gruffly, tell them, you are on a collision course. Uh, uh, alter your course 20 degrees. The answer from the source of light came back moments later. Advisable, you change your course 20 degrees. The captain was insulted. Not only was his authority being challenged, but also it was being done to a junior seaman. Send another message, he snarled. We are the HMS Defiant, a 35,000-ton battleship of the Dreadnought class. Change course 20 degrees. Brilliant, sir, came the reply. I'm Seaman O'Reilly of the second class. Change your course immediately. Indignant and red-faced, the captain shouted, We are the flagship of Admiral Sir William Atkins Wills. Change your course 20 degrees. There was a moment of silence before Seaman O'Reilly replied, We are a lighthouse, sir. <laughs> Cracks me up every time I say it. Think of it. The admiral, not knowing what was ahead, pushing real hard to get his own way, didn't realize that there was something greater than him. And today I want you to know that that lighthouse represents for us, that lighthouse represents for us, the mission of God. The mission of God, like a lighthouse, is strategically placed. It's there by God, the mission of God. The lighthouse shows the way, even as the mission of God does. The lighthouse moves for no one, even as the mission of God does. And it serves a very, very valuable purpose, even as the mission of God does. Sherry and I go because the call of God, and, but we go because it's the mission of God to do it. Now, the term missio dei is a Latin term. I think most of you might know it, the Missio Dei. You can hear it in there. It means the mission of God. It's the part of God's work in the world. That we understand that God has all these works going on in the world, and one part of that work of God is his mission to save people. It's the mission of God. It's like a big canvas. We have a small part on the canvas of God's creation. God moved. He created. God desires relationship. And therefore, he sends his son and because he sent his son, therefore we go. That's the mission of God. God created. God desires relationship. God sends. Therefore we go. Let's look at the first point here of this picture. When I saw this picture, I took my, son's, uh, my son Jonathan and Sherry took this picture. That's me sitting in the front of a Monet painting. And it was the most beautiful painting I've seen in many, many years. 
There were a lot of people there at the time at this museum, and for one moment, I sat down, and Jonathan and Sherry said, there was that one moment when no one was there, and we got the picture. Now, the only thing I can see is my bald head, and I, when I look at it, I say, Dad, what are you doing there? Because I look like my father from the back. I don't know if you knew my father. But I remember that moment and seeing that picture and sitting in awe. And I was there about three or four minutes and no one walked by. And it was a quiet moment with God and me as he spoke to my heart. And he began to tell me, Jim, this is the canvas of the mission of God. This is what it's like. You see it from a distance and it's a beautiful, beautiful colors. All meshing together, all coming together, all moving together. But the closer you get, you begin to see more and more detail of this picture. And that detail is your part in the great canvas of the mission of God. Have you ever been to a museum? I think most of you have. Have you ever seen an oil painting? I think that most of you have. If you stand at a distance from an oil painting, it looks, you know, it looks one way. You get a little bit closer, it looks another way. When you get up real close, if you get really, really, really close, you begin to see the strokes, strokes of the artist. It's a beautiful thing. If you haven't tried it, try it sometime. It will change your life. And as you stand in front of, oh, don't go there quite yet. As you stand in front of the, that's my second point and the third point, so we'll get to those. As you stand in front of, uh, of, of a grand canvas sometime, think about the mission of God that he calls us to. It's the mission of God, the Latin term. The mission of God, the great canvas of the work of God on this earth, the first move that God did is God created because God is an active God. It's like this. The Bible says the earth was without form and void. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth, and God said, let there be light. It was as if one day everything was silent. There was nothing there, nothing, no light, no anything. It was all silent. It was all there. The whole universe was like that. And one moment, in one second, in one time, God moved. And his first act, his first move was not to yawn, was not to stretch as sometimes we see in the cartoons or whatever. It wasn't to get out of bed or anything. God's first move was a creative act. He brought into existence light in this world. God is an active God. That tells us something about God and tells us something about the mission of God. And when God began to create this universe and God began to create it, he created, if you will, this canvas and this beautiful picture that we can see from a distance. His creation is where we serve him. We don't have a part in this creation. We didn't have a part in that creative force, but we have a part in the canvas. Let me move on to explain it a little bit more. Now we'll go to number two, please. Thank you. We take a closer look at this very canvas, and you see the, the, uh, the water lilies. Now, I love these things. I don't know if you like them or not, but I love to look at water lilies. I don't know if you've seen them before, but uh, they, have, they take on many, many colors, many, many shapes, and the best thing about it is fish are usually going on underneath them. You know, I don't know if there's lilies in this lake next door here, but if there are and you're a fisherman, get your boat over there and throw the lure underneath them because that's where the big fish are. Okay, these are important aspects. As we look closer at this picture, we begin to see flowers. We begin to see a closer thing. God's part in creation was to create. Our part in that creation comes in the second part. God desires relationship. In fact, the Bible tells us in John 1.14, he says this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now let me explain something very quickly to you. God created the earth, and then God came to this earth. God sent. He became flesh and he dwelt among us. Now when God came to this earth, he didn't live above us to lord over us, arrogantly asserting his authority. He is lord, but he doesn't lord over us. He didn't live below us when he came to this earth so that he was our mere servant so that when we snap our fingers, we have what we want. Jump, jump, move, move. I want, I want. Gimme, 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 gimme. I saw the other day, I, th I saw the other day a, um, uh, on YouTube this young boy who was throwing a fit, and I don't know why I was watching it, but this young boy who was throwing a fit in a grocery store little kid, because he didn't get the toy. And his mother just stood there literally for 15 minutes and videoed it. And I'm thinking, she was crazy for videoing it, but who's more crazy? I'm watching it. 
You know, think of it. I'm watching this. And this kid literally rolled on the floor. Literally. I didn't watch the whole 15 minutes. I can only take a few moments of it. But she just said, okay, you can roll on the floor. And she, she showed it, and it was, on, it was on YouTube. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. Sometimes that's like me with God when I don't get my own way. Sometimes it's me. But God is not below us, and Jesus is not below us. He didn't live below us so that we're mere servants, that he's a mere servant, that we snap our fingers and get what he wants. But he came to live among us, to be one of us. It signifies his design, his divine desire to have relationship with us. The second greatest creative act, other than creating the world, was the act of creating relationship with us. God wants to know us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And this desire for relationship is the basis for the mission of God, and what God desires for this earth. Now, concerning relationships, relationships are what save the world. A relationship with God saves a person. Relationships with people, what we have, are a part of God's plan for us. Concerning these relationships that save the world, author and professor Leonard Sweet says this, some interesting things. He says, the way to save the world is not through more rules rules to live by, but through right relationships to live for. To save the world, we need something more biblical than higher standards. We need higher relationships. We need less to be true to our principles and much more to be true to our relationships. To save the world, we don't need the courage of our convictions. We need the courage of our relationships we especially need the courage of a right relationship with the creator, the creation, and our fellow creatures. Our problem in reaching the world is that we make rules more important than relationship. God help us to have relationships in our lives because that second creative act is when God said, I will come and I will have a relationship with you. And it's relationships that saves the world and it's relationships that with, with one another that also save the world as we serve together in Jesus Christ. If we look closely enough at the great canvas of God's mission, you will see that the act of God coming to live among us was not an act of power to rule, but an act of love. May I say almost as beautiful, or more beautiful, but not unlike the beauty of that flower and that lily pad as we look closely, as it opens up in the sun, and we see the colors, and we see the inside. It's an act of love, an act of one who is seeking relationship with us, and therefore, right relationships are the saving key in the world. I'm here to tell you today that rules will not save the world. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't go there, don't breathe this, don't look like that, don't be that, don't sit that way, don't move that way. Stop your fiddling. Those are all things I heard my whole life. <laughs> I, couldn't sit, I couldn't sit still in the pew. That's why I'm a preacher, you know that. <laughs> Today, I still can't sit still. My wife will look at me, will you stop moving? It's just one of those things. But it's not about rules. It's not about the right rules. It's about right relationships. If we can get past rules and see the hearts of people and look closer at the canvas of God that he came to live among us, when he came to live among us, the relationship blossomed right before our very eyes. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Oh, that's a beautiful Advent understanding. And that's the second part of the great mission, the Missio Dei. The third part that I'm going to right now is an even closer look. We get to the flower, not just the flower, but we get to see the strokes of the brush of the artist. John 20, 21 said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So God's first act of creativity was to create the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form of void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. His second act of great creativity was that he developed relationships with us. The word became flesh. Imagine that. He came to live among us. Not only did he come to live among us, but then that third final act of creativity. Jesus said, the Word who lived among us, that Advent child, that child who we will celebrate his coming in the form of a child, that person said to us, 
as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. What does that mean? Because God loved, that love expressed in his coming to live among us, we are to love the same way. We go and we seek out and we encourage relationships, not a relationship not with just the creator and the creation, but with our fellow creatures, those who are created. We share that relationship with them and the relationship we have with God, that is what changes the world, not the rules, but the relationship, the relationship with people. We get in their lives and we, be, we pray with them. We serve them. We help to meet their needs. We walk alongside of them, even as Jesus walked alongside of us. So as I return to the original question, why do we go and why do we do what we do? We do it because of the mission of God, the missio Dei. We've committed our lives to be a part of the great picture that God continues to paint We say that Christ was born, but really and truthfully, we need to know at this Advent season that Christ was not born. Yes, he was. But he was sent. God sent him to live among us. And so at this Advent season and this holiday season, as we see all of the presents and all of the trees and all of the lights and all of the joy about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, realize that God had three creative acts in all of this, and this is all a part of that. He created the earth. He created relationship, and he loved so much that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But when we look at the baby Jesus in the manger, remember that that man not only lived among us, but he grew into an adult. He lived his life. He knew what pain was. He knew what sorrow was. He knew what death was. But in the midterm, he told us, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. The great mission of God. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful uh, for the mission of God. And as we take this moment to serve communion together, I pray that we would realize that at that final moment when you died on the cross, that was a part of the mission of God as well. And we thank you for coming to live among us. We thank you that we can have relationships with each other. And we thank you, Lord, that you've asked us to go, and we will go. In Jesus' name, amen.